Welcome, everybody. My name is Stephen Chin, and I'm going to be talking about what you can do with Raspberry Pi, um, specifically Java on Raspberry Pi. I am a Java technology ambassador for Oracle, so I speak about Java technologies. Um, I'm probably best known for the book I wrote on JavaFX, but I've also been doing a lot with embedded technologies over the past year. Um, and this will be a pretty interactive session. So you guys can stop me at any time you want to ask questions, interact. And likewise, I get to ask you questions when I feel like it. And hopefully, somebody in the audience is nice enough to respond. <laughs> All right, so Java runs on a bunch of different devices, which you might not even know. Um, everything from small devices like parking meters, RFID, intelligent power meters, um, medium-sized devices like routers and switches, um, home automation, network systems, and then big devices like cars and, and printers and stuff. I was actually just in Japan chatting with um, a bunch of printer companies like Canon and Rico, and it's surprising how much Java technology these guys use in their, in their products. Um, traditionally, you've seen Java ME used in embedded devices. Um, Java ME is um, a subset of the Java platform and has some small changes and deviations to make it run better in extremely low memory footprint devices. Um, as a result, you need to modify your applications to get them to run in Java ME. What I'm going to be showing you guys today is Java SE embedded. The nice thing about Java SE Embedded is you can use all the same tools and technologies you use on desktop applied to embedded devices and run it on really, really small chips. Um, so I have, I brought toys. So um, this is an example of the Centurion module. It has inside of it a little ARM processor um, a 3G chip, and on the back is an LGA mount where you can mount this on an existing embedded board to integrate with other devices. Um, and you program the chip using Java, currently Java ME, although they're working on a Java SE embedded build. Um, the ARM processor they're running is powerful enough to, to do either. And it lets you hook up wireless connectivity to a lot of systems where you might otherwise have trouble getting it in a small form factor. Um, so one example of where they've used these, I'm actually, I'm going to pass these around the room so you guys can, can take a look, so if you wouldn't mind, and I'll give one to this side of the room. Um, if someone wouldn't mind just bringing it back up to the front, um, don't, don't mind interrupting the session, you can just pop up. So that's an example of a really, really tiny device, and one place where they've used those is in the um, rainforest. So they used a chip like this to track far rainforest um, deforestation, people cutting down trees and um, taking them away from the rainforest. And what they would do is they would make small cutouts in the trunk, insert a, a module which had power, a chip like this, um, and a GPS and accelerometer on it. So when the tree fall, fell over, they could track um, by the accelerometer that it, or the gyroscope that it had fallen, and then um, GPS for current location, and then transmit over 3G so they could track it. So a cool use of small embedded technology. And um, you guys are all Java hackers. I'm sure you could come up with much more interesting use cases for Java running on really small embedded devices. So what we're, I'm going to be primarily focusing on today is Java running on the Raspberry Pi. Uh -huh. OK, that cable doesn't want to come out. Take it out this end. So this is um, a Raspberry Pi in a, in a clear case. Um, it's a $35 computer. How, how many of you guys already have Raspberry Pis? OK. A few. The rest of you should buy one. <laughs> tell, tell your boss this is for very important um, prototyping work. I'm sure they'll be happy to happy to tee one up for you. And um, it's it's almost a little computer. Um, 
I have some of the specs on the next page here. So the, the processor, the system on a chip, um, is in the center there. It's a Broadcom BCM 2835. Um, the Model B has 512 megabytes of memory, so you can run real programs on it. Um, it runs at 700 megahertz by default, but you can crank it up to a gigahertz overclocking it. And it runs cool enough, you don't even need to put any sort of fan or heat sink on it. Um, you can just air cool it even inside of a plastic case like this. Um, and that's the reason they use chips like this and small embedded form factors like the um, Ceterion chip I showed you. Um, this is an ARM 11, it's, so it's an ARM v6 processor, and you can run full Linux on it. So you can run Debian, which is what I'll be running today, Arc Linux, and there's a couple other distributions which work as well. Um, I think the only distribution which doesn't work is Ubuntu because they stuck with the ARM v7 um, for their releases. Um, so I'm not sure if they plan on ever backporting back to ARM v6 to support the Raspberry Pi. Um, and it has a lot of interconnectivity, so you can hook it up to different displays and devices. So there's HDMI, that's what I'll be using for the display today to show you guys what's happening on here. Also VGA, you can hook it up to a TV. Um, audio output, a couple USB ports, an Ethernet port. Um, one thing to note about the USB ports is it's both powered via USB, so there's a USB jack on the back, which you can supply power to. The, the newer devices, um, ones that came out within the past, um, I think pretty much 2013, you can actually power them off the, um, um, the output USB ports as well, the, um, the host. Was it host or client? I forget. Oh, thank you very much. You guys are very efficient. Um, if you didn't get a chance to see it for some reason, you can just hop up and, and grab one. So you can actually power it off the host USB, but there's another USB port in the back specifically for powering it. Um, don't power it off both. That's usually not a good thing to do. And um, it also has GPIO pins on top. And this is where you get a lot of the hardware connectivity. So you can use the GPIO pins to hook it up to accelerometer, um, hook it up to buttons, switches, anything which supports an I squared C bus. And I'll talk a little bit about the software you would need to control that for the Java SE embedded release. All right, so I've been talking about the hardware, and we have a few folks who have this. So do our, do our Raspberry Pi experts know what these two funky connectors on top are for? I'm sure if you have one, you've always wondered what the, the weird port's on top. It kind of, it's funky, it pops up and. No, but I want to go with capacitor port, but mine doesn't have any you don't, you don't have a capacitor. Oh. And it still works? <laughs> Okay, I've heard I've heard about folks putting really big caps on here. Um, I think it's I think it's meant for power surges, so it can um, supply uneven power input. If you put large enough caps on, then you can actually um, um, keep it powered if it runs at a power for a few seconds. And they use that for netbooks. Sometimes when you hook it up to a netbook for a display screen, when you open or close the display, the USB cuts out. So if you have really big caps on it, you can um, keep it running. Okay, so anyway, back to these two. Anyone want to venture a guess? They're, 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 they're for ribbon cables. You, you look like you know. Maybe? Yeah? No. <laughs> All right, so one of these is for the Raspberry Pi camera. So they just released a camera module um, on the Raspberry Pi site. And it's, it's pretty cool. It hooks up via ribbon cable, and you can use it for um, you can use it for displaying video. Let me let me get you a picture of what that looks like. Oh, and we even have network. Um, you can also use USB cameras via the USB port, but this is a much more compact and elegant solution, and it goes directly through the GPU, so it uses less of your precious CPU, which is pretty constrained. The only problem right now is you can't actually order these. They came out like I think about a month ago and they've been, they were back ordered the day they released it. Um, so if you got one of the early production runs, you were really, really lucky, but um, for the rest of us, we have to wait till they make more of them. Okay, so that's one port. 
And the second one is for an LCD panel. So I did bring a toy, which I'll show you guys in a, in a sec. So currently, they have a nice port for an LCD panel, but they don't actually, they never actually made an LCD panel that works with the port yet. And since it's a proprietary interface through the GPU, nobody else can do it. Um, it's not open source, unfortunately, that portion. But there's a nice workaround hack, and um, I'll show you guys this touch screen working with the Raspberry Pi in a sec. We'll get to that a little later. Okay, so anyway, that's the two. Camera and LCD with touch for those two ports. Um, and then, like I mentioned, you can do lots of cool stuff with the um, GPIO pins. This is an example of an accelerometer module, the MPU9150. Um, so you can hook this up and then get motion detection on your Raspberry Pi, just like you would from a cell phone or other device. Now remember, this is like low level inputs. You're not gonna get a clean API like you would with um, a mobile phone, but you'll get some, some nice low level numbers you can try to interpolate and, and figure out what's going on. Um, and any device which supports I squared C or um, a couple other interfaces you can use via the Pi4j library. Um, Pi4j is an open source library. It works with the Java SE embedded release. Um, and it'll let you take advantage of the GPIO pins. Eventually, the, um, they're gonna roll some of this support into the official Java release, so you can use um, APIs that comes directly out of the JDK. But until that happens in a future Java release, um, using some of these open source libraries is your best option. Okay, and the other thing I'm gonna show you guys is the touch screen. So this is a little bit of information about the touch screen, which I'm gonna be showing you guys. So it's made by Chalkboard Electronics. They're a little company in Israel which um, does some nice um, custom hardware. Let's see. Okay, we've got our cable set from these guys. The, the workaround they did is this LCD typically is um, powered over one of those LCD cables like what the Raspberry Pi has. But since there's no interface for that yet, um, they rigged a little daughter board, there we go, which takes the LCD input and then converts it to HDMI, or rather takes the HDMI and converts it to the LCD signal. And um, the cable also separately breaks out touch to USB. So you can do touch over USB plus um, take advantage of HDMI and then effectively use the, use the touch screen. Um, and if you're interested, take a photo of um, this slide or check the slide decks later because um, I got the guys at Chalkboard Electronics to give us a, a discount for 10% off. Um, I think all their screens, I checked over the weekend because I wanted to see the status of the new seven inch LCD screens they've been working on. So they're almost ready with those. They had some production issues but pretty much everything they make is back-ordered. <laughs> um, but there it's, it's pretty good quality and um, relatively inexpensive. The 10-inch version is $135 for the LCD panel plus all the connectors, and it's, they've been gradually improving the revisions. This is a late revision screen I just got from them, and they properly did the EDID support, so the, it tells the Raspberry Pi what resolution to support. You don't need to do anything funky. Um, on the early versions of the board, you had to do some custom things with your Raspberry Pi um, video graphics setup to get it working. And if you did this yourself, you would definitely need to do some hacking to get an LCD panel to hook up to the Pi. So it's nice that they've packaged a solution which is pretty much plug and play. Okay, so before we get started on hacking, anybody have any questions about hardware? All right. So what we're gonna try to do here is set up a Raspberry Pi. I have all the instructions on my blog, um, JavaFX on Raspberry Pi, um, three easy steps. But you, if you go to steveonjava.com, it's fairly easy to find. And it details the instructions for this. So install Linux. You guys can pretty much handle that, right? Okay. Um, it's, it's basically that easy with the Raspberry Pi distribution. Um, 
On the site, just I think one or two days ago, they introduced a new installer called Noob. There's a fancy acronym, but <laughs> I think they just wanted it to be called Noob because it sounded cool. Um, I, would, I would hold off on trying to use that until they work out the kinks in it. It's going to be the new go forward mechanism for flashing the Raspberry Pi. But I tried it out over the, um, over the weekend, and I was unable to, to get it to work properly and image a correct card. So I, I, I have a feeling they have to work out some bugs in it before they actually get it fine-tuned. The instructions on my blog explain how you would image it using um, a standard image with either Win32 Disk Imager or um, DD for command line with Linux. Um, or for Macintosh, they have a, um, a program which will prompt you for the image file and let you install it. So I'd recommend going that route for now if you have a Raspberry Pi rather than using the new Noob tool. Um, probably in the next few weeks, they'll work out the kinks in that and it'll be much, much better. All right, step two, download and copy Java 8 for RMEA. Um, I have a link on my blog for this, but literally it's as easy as um, downloading it and then unzipping it on your Raspberry Pi. So most of you can probably handle unzipping a, yeah. And step three is we're going to deploy and run some JavaFX apps. All right, so let's see if we can actually get this working on the hardware we have here. So, so you guys can actually see what's going on here. I've taken my Raspberry Pi, which is a nice um, you know, $35 inexpensive embedded device. And I'm going to be hooking it up to a um, capture device. This is, this is actually, I was chatting with, um, with Max, the guys doing the recording here. This is the same image capture device they're using, but it runs about two or $300. And I'm going to be hooking it up to a, a two or $3,000 laptop so you guys can see it on screen. So this is not the most efficient setup for using your Raspberry Pi. Um, at home, a better alternative would be just to plug this into your TV. But this works well for presentations because um, this way I don't have to rely upon the venue actually having a projector which supports the Raspberry Pi properly. Yep. Okay, so you're wondering if there's an IR port or RF port on the Raspberry Pi. So this is really a, com this is a common question. And the reason people want um, IR or RF for the Raspberry Pi is, do, does anyone know what the most common use of Raspberry Pis is right now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so most people you know, buy this great embedded device, and they hook it up to their TV and use it as a, they put XBNC on it and use it as a media player. And actually, the, the GPU on this is the, one of the best features. It has a really nice GPU. It'll, it'll kick the pants off your average set-top box. Um, but anyway, so if you're using it in that way, you might want an IR remote or something to control it. Um, and the best way to do that, it doesn't come with one built in, but you can buy a USB dongle, hook it up via USB, and then if, as long as you get one which has supported Linux drivers, you can do IR to the Raspberry Pi. Same thing with Wi-Fi. It comes with built-in Ethernet, but there's a bunch of known Wi-Fi modules which work quite well with the Raspberry Pi, so you can do wireless instead of going over cable, um, Bluetooth, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty much anything you can find supported Linux drivers for, you can hook up via USB to add to the Pi. Okay, so a question is for sound recording on the Pi. So it has an audio output, but non-audio input, Although you can do sound recording, you just you hook up a USB mic. <laughs> so pretty much the answer to most questions about how do I add hardware, it's either add something via USB, which if you can find drivers for Linux, that's the easiest. Um, second easiest is if it supports serial, you can do USB to serial. So that's a common way to hook up um, NFC readers or other devices like that. And then finally, if you want to hack a little hardware, the GPIO pins are the best way to do low-level um, input-output from the device. Okay, but good questions. All right, so I'm going to attempt to get the Pi working. 
on my computer. Um, I'm hooking up via Ethernet as well. And the reason for that is that hopefully we will get some um, a local area connection to the Pi so we can do SSH. And um, I'm using VNC, VLC as the display for the screen. So the text here is too small to read. I mean, if I started typing on the Pi, you wouldn't really be able to see what's going on. But we can open up via the Ethernet an SSH terminal and get a nice big display so you can see what's happening on the Pi, um, which I'll do in a sec. The reason I want the display primarily is to see what IP address the Raspberry Pi picks up from my computer. Um, since I'm doing internet connection sharing, it should pick in an IP. All right. So it attempted to start up its own networking and realized it couldn't, and it picked up an IP of, oh, that's even tiny for me, 192.168.243. Okay, so you'll, you'll typically get a, a nice big fat warning saying fingerprint authentication, blah, 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 and you can ignore that. The um, default image you, login password is Pi and Raspberry, which will get you into the device. Okay, and we get a, a nice little Linux prompt here. Um, and then we can navigate the, the file system so it's a normal, I have a Debian distribution already installed. Um, in the op directory, oh wow, that blue really doesn't show up. <laughs> um, let's see, there's an option to turn off color on LS. What, what you, anyone know offhand? Yeah, yeah, that might help. All right, well, Let's do this. I'll just run Java, and then you can actually see the output. A color equals empty? Color? None. OK, OK. So if I did this. Yeah, much better. Thank you. All right, so I have um, a JDK 1.8 version, which I downloaded and unzipped already onto the SD card here. And um, it has everything you would expect in a normal release, including um, JavaFX support. So I'm gonna be showing some visual stuff on the, graph on the Raspberry Pi using the um, LCD screen. Okay, and then I just ran the, um, the Java so you can see the version, which is 180 EA. Um, this is the December release of the um, SE Embedded, which is what you'll get currently on the website. Um, I believe in the next few weeks we will be doing nightly builds or weekly builds of the same distribution, so you'll get more recent versions of the um, Java SE Embedded, which will match up with the desktop Java 1.8 releases. Um, and part of the reason you'll want that is, you, you notice I have an internal build on there. The reason I pulled that one is because the, there was a bug in the touch screen, driver support, which they fixed since December, and um, you, you need the most current build to actually get working. Um, so it works for display, but the touch input itself doesn't work in the December build. Um, but we got it um, reported. Actually, I was in doo -doo -doo, Rome. Italy, speaking at Code Motion, and one of the conference organizers there is the guy who reported the touchscreen bug. So I, I met him face to face, even though we'd been chatting on Jira about the, the issue. Since I did display locally here, I was testing it, and then he, was, he found the issue in, in Rome, and we, we bumped into each other at the conference. <laughs> okay, so um, let's see if we can get some stuff working here. I am going to use NetBeans as my IDE. Um, if you want to do the same thing, you can install NetBeans 7.3 with um, Java 7, which includes JavaFX. 
and you'll be able to do exactly the same thing I'm going to be showing you. Um, we will use incredibly large presenter fonts. Let's do, well, that's huge. I think that should be big enough. Is that good in the back? OK. And um, let's start a new project. Um, I'm going to choose a FXML application because that will give us um, a XML file we can configure using Scene Builder, which is a visual GUI building tool for building JavaFX applications. So the, what just got created, uh, you can ignore my groovy hacking. So it created a main class, JaxConfTest, an FXML file, which is our UI definition, and then a controller file. Um, the main class is pretty much boilerplate. Um, you have to extend the application class, implement, override the start method. All this start method does is load the FXML file for the UI definition. It doesn't actually do anything interesting. And then, you know, a public static void method is the entry point. So that is pretty much boilerplate. All the interesting stuff happens in the XML file. So this sets up an anchor pane, a button, and a label. Um, this is what it looks like in XML format, but we will use the um, visual builder instead, scene builder. If you install scene builder 1.0, it will just magically open in scene builder when you double click it from NetBeans. IntelliJ, as of the last patch release, has really good JavaFX integration as well. And Eclipse with EFX Clips also has built in JavaFX support. So there's quite good IDE support as well. Um, and on the left here are a bunch of components you can add in. So we could pop an image in our scene graph. On the right are properties. Um, so let's see. Let's, let's grab a camera picture. All right, so now we got a little camera picture. That didn't work. Boop. Boop. Finder. Okay, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the JaxCon folder, and pop in. Um, pop in the um, image we just downloaded, Jack source comp test. Downloads. All right, hold on a sec. I thought we just saved it. Now we've saved it. Okay. So now we got a little JPEG picture of a camera. And we'll go back to Scene Builder and. Um, OK. So pretty easy to add images. There's a bunch of UI controls for tables and charts, all sorts of stuff. Um, you can resize the scene just by dragging and dropping. Um, I'm going to make it monstrous, because the Raspberry Pi default resolution is 1920 by 1080, which is huge. Um, you get low lines to align things. OK, that's a massive Pi camera. And you can also preview in the window here. All right, so here's a question for you guys. What, what should we make happen when you click the button? What should happen to our Pi camera? Oh, you're right, it is upside down. <laughs> All right, rotate 90 degrees. And what's, what's, your, what's your favorite color? Blue? Green? Yellow? Pink? pink? All right, pink. <laughs> All right, let's rotate it upside down and make it pink for him. All right, so. For pink, the easiest way to do that is to, in um, Scene Builder, you can add effects. Um, 
and we can do color adjustments. And then do a little hue. Oh, that's, is that pink enough for you? <laughs> a little more purple than pink, but we'll go with it. Um, yeah, okay. I want it a little better centered. There we go, perfectly centered. And then for rotation, we're going to actually have to code something. So let's, let's save this. Go back into NetBeans. Um, now if we run this, we should see exactly what we saw in Scene Builder, just um, actually running with code rather than executing an XML file. OK. But the button's not active yet. Um, so we'll go to the third file, which I didn't open yet, which is the controller file. The way controllers work is you can annotate variables with the at FXML, and it will inject those um, with the corresponding ID. You can also um, put methods in here, again, annotate it with an FXML, and that lets you call it from your, from your code. So if we look at the XML, um, we're already calling handle button action when you click the, the button, so that's already in there. But our image view is missing an ID. Um, let's just call him image. And see here is our color adjustment. That's a nice little effect as well. But it's pre-applied, so we want to, I guess, unapply it and then reapply it. Um, okay, so that should get us our, our image. And then the initialize gets called immediately on, on startup, so we can um, do our grab off the effect. and clear it. Um, and then we'll save this off. Um, and then we click, we will reapply the effect and rotate it. Um, I'm going to use a rotation, rotate, translation, is that how you do it? Rotate Transition Builder. The way builders work is you um, have a create method on them and a build method. Um, the create method is a static method which gives you a builder so you can chain methods. And then um, when you call build at the end, it returns the object back, which is going to be an instance of a rotate transition. So in the middle here, we can, we can put all sorts of um, properties, like what node does it apply to? Um, image. What angle are we going to rotate it? So 180 degrees, but I say we, we spin it a couple times before we stop. So it has to be an odd number. What, what's your favorite odd number? Seven? Okay. Um, and then duration, let's just give it Seven seconds? Five seconds? OK. Thank you for participating. Good job. <laughs> OK, so I think we're almost done. Any, anyone notice something I forgot to do? Yes, yeah, so I think. You guys are close. Like, I, I created the rotation, but I didn't actually do anything with it. Um, so you need to actually start the rotation and tell it to go. So I'm just going to do it the lazy way and chain it right here. Play. And I think that should do it. Let's, let's see how we're doing. Oh, what did I do? Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right, good, good thing I have folks to pair program with me because my, my um, presentation and coding skills are somewhat lacking. All right, so let's, let's see how we're doing. So you're, 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 what do you think of the color? Good? Rotation? Yeah. 
Okay, so that's, that's cute. We can do it on the desktop, but that's not really why we're here. So let's see if we can get it running on the Pi. Now the nice thing, as I mentioned earlier, if, you were, if you're doing ME or um, the other stack, you'd have to recompile and do all this stuff um, for the device. With SE, we can take exactly the same jar file we just built and run it on device. You could also move the code over and compile it on the Pi, um, but we're just gonna copy the jar file right now. And the way I'm gonna hook up is I'm gonna do SFTP using Cyberduck. You can use your favorite um, SFTP program of choice to get files around, uh, what did I say, 243? Yeah, thank you, 43. All right, and then log in with Pi and Raspberry. Okay, so now we got the <coughs> Pi file system up. Go to the dist folder, grab our jar file and pop it in. Okay. And we should see uh, our Jacks guy there. There we go. Okay, so it's somewhere in this directory even though I can't read that huge list. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, start our Java process. You can add this to your path as well. Um, and there's a couple extra arguments you need to add on just for the early access. These will go away in the final release. Um, the first one is in the early access they didn't add the JavaFX libraries to the bootstrap class path. Um, in the final JDK 1.8 release, these will all be right on the bootstrap strap jet class paths. You can ignore that. The other one is um, they also didn't default the JavaFX platform. In the final release, it will default to EGLFB, which is the 3D accelerated graphics pipeline. Um, but in the preview release, you need to specify this explicitly. There's like five or six different pipelines in different experimental spaces. Um, but this is the fastest and the one which will be the de default in the final release. Um, and then runner guy. Okay, so that should run it and we'll see the output in the VLC window. Um, okay, so we got OpenGL ES2 embedded device detected. Um, I forgot something important, I'm gonna kill it. We need a mouse, otherwise we can't click the button. Let's see, mouse, mouse, mouse. Aha. So one of the things which you'll notice <clears throat> with the Pi is when you plug in USB devices, it um, randomly reboots. I got lucky and it didn't reboot that time. <laughs> so if you plug in or take something out of the USB port and you notice your Pi reboots, that's quite normal. The, the USB ports are both low power and a little bit um, finicky. Okay, so that looks good. We got our guy, and then let's see if I can mouse. Go. Okay, so the, the tearing you see is from my capture card. Um, that's not from the Pi. Um, the slight pause you saw at the beginning was a GC pause. Um, but if we do it again, we should see it without the pause. Okay, so you guys can create your own apps running on the Pi pretty easily. All right, so I'm gonna, the last thing I'm gonna show you is <coughs> the touch screen. I'm gonna pop up one of the demos which um, I'll, I'll show you the great conf version of it, which I did for um, a conference in, in Denmark a couple weeks ago as a, a signage app for the conference. Um, while I'm setting that up, you guys can ask questions and I'll be happy to answer questions while I'm fiddling with resetting hardware. So, ask away. Okay, so the question is, do you need to use the soft float distribution? And fortunately, um, the latest version of the early access 
is hard float. For those of you who don't know the difference between soft float and hard float, um, soft float relies on the CPU to do floating point instructions, which uh, for desktop processors is basically unheard of, but in the mobile world is quite common because you have a lot of low power chips. Um, the ARM6 supports hard float instruction set, and by taking advantage of it, you get much better performance, especially for graphics stuff, which is why they prioritize getting that done for the early access. Um, so the short answer is yes. You, you get hard float. You actually should and have to use the hard float build. And that's the default distribution for um, Raspberry Pi as well as using hard float. Okay, so I'm hooking up the LCD connector. Uh, let's see if I got this right. Uh, I need power as well. The um, screen requires a little bit more juice than you can get off the Raspberry Pi. Okay, Ethernet, LCD screen. All right, that looks pretty good. Um, now, I'm going to switch over VLC so you guys don't have to get up. And what we'll do instead is we're going to open up a new capture showing my um, FaceTime camera. All right, all right. And this way, I move the hardware in the right spot. You can kind of see what's going on. Oh, wow, that's really bad glare. OK. So let's see if we can get the Pi powered first. Power. Okay, and this also gives you a chance to see the, uh, let's see, where am I going? This way, rotate. The lights on the Pi as well. So I have the lights in the top corner. Um, the one light is for activity. Three are for ethernet, and another is just for power on. Okay, so that stuff is working good. Here's the the Pi screen itself, um, it's not that bright because it has a sensor here. This is an um, ambient light sensor, although if we put it near something bright, it should brighten the screen a little bit. Wow, these, these lights are just not working with me. All right. Let's see if we can SSH into the um, device again. Hmm. Ah. Okay. So. This is, this is what happens to your demo machine sometimes. It wouldn't be a real demo unless you had a, a full hard crash <laughs> of your computer. <laughs> okay, so always have a backup plan. So this is a, um, a little physical keyboard. And while we're waiting for my computer to do its thing, we can physically hook this up and log into the Pi on the command prompt and then kick off the demo that way. This is also a nice um, lean back device to use if you're um, on your sofa and you wanna browse your um, media collection, you can use this keyboard from a distance to, um, to do stuff. OK. 
OK. Start great conf. OK, so that's now booting up the demo. Uh, thank you for restarting everything. All right, first presentation. So this is the, um, this is the backup slide if the demo didn't work. <laughs> um, this is the DevOps-themed version of it, which we used outside of the big conference rooms. So you could see what the current session was going on, and the next few sessions were floating by on a, on a big HDMI monitor. Um, I did a great conf-themed version of it for the Groovy conference in Denmark, which is, which is what I'm bringing up on the display. What I'm going to recommend is um, after I finish this and it boots up here, it's probably better just for you guys to come up and actually look at the physical display up here. Um, I was getting too much reflection off the lights up here to actually um, show the screen through the camera on my computer. But it is, it's in the middle of booting right now. And in conclusion, you can build some graphically rich, fast performing apps on the, the Raspberry Pi. Um, I showed you how to set up everything from scratch. Um, please check out my blog, steveonjava.com, for the detailed instructions. And you can start doing this today. So the early access release is out. You can run full Java. Um, you can even run, people have been doing small um, EE clusters on Raspberry Pis. You can run desktop applications using JavaFX technology. And you can interface with lots of hardware using the Pi4j libraries um, I mentioned earlier. So there's quite a lot you can do with the Raspberry Pi for a, a small $35 computer. OK, so I'm going to leave this slide up. This is my contact info, um, Twitter, and blog. And then if you want to see the um, running application, come up to the front, and you can take a look at it. But thank you for attending.